Okay, um, we're right on schedule then to start our panel. It's not surprising to me that almost every speaker yesterday mentioned either substance abuse or alcohol or drug abuse. And I wanted to just spend a minute talking about the differences in those terms. You know, the DSM has alcohol use disorders and substance, uh, yeah, illegal, illicit substance use disorders. We've gotten rid of this category called abuse, so you'll no longer see alcohol abuse, even though it's in the title of my institute. Um, it's important to know the distinction. Often you'll hear the term substance abuse. Globally, that usually means alcohol, because other substances are available in certain parts of the world. Certainly in the United States, we have very few people who would, meet, who would only use alcohol. Uh, but around the globe, alcohol is the substance that's used. It's, it's easily made. It's a cottage industry in sub-Saharan Africa. Many women are making a living off of you know, brewing beer and selling it from their homes. It's also a big cause of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders in sub-Saharan Africa. But it's, you know, it's available, it's, it's, it's cheap, it's, you know, it's easy to get. And, and in the developing world where a lot of our focus needs to be in terms of violence, we have to really consider alcohol. And what's the relationship of alcohol to violence? Well, it, it's complicated. It's very complicated. It's, it has a role in perpetration. It has a role in victim. Victimization, it has a role in uh, victims trying to, as a coping mechanism, but yet the, some of the data has shown that most people who would be victims to use alcohol as a coping, also it was their partners who drank, and, and if the partners didn't drink, they don't use alcohol. So it's a very complicated uh, relationship. Most people, when you look at public polls, think that alcohol causes aggression. And I, I think that that is also not so simple and clear. And so we have a panel of speakers this morning. We're going to start with um, what we know from animal research and basic science about alcohol and aggression. We're going to move then into alcohol and intimate personal violence, how it's a risk factor and how um, you can address it as you're trying to address that problem. And then we're going to move on to the alcohol policy field. Uh, as I said, it was hazardous drinking and not an alcohol use disorder or alcohol dependence that was the most associated with violence in terms of population attributable risk. So we have two speakers who are going to focus on the, um, the policy approaches to preventing the violence that can come from alcohol, alcohol use or misuse, as we say. One um, who's going to talk about the policies uh, research in the United States, and then our final speaker will, will talk about what's happening in Brazil. So with that, I'm going to st start with Klaus Michek, who is the Moses Hunt Professor of Psychology, Psychiatry, Pharmacology, and Neuroscience at Tufts University. Dr. Michek's laboratory is investigating neuroadaptive mechanisms by which specific social stressors can intensify compulsive drug use or, or alternatively engender depressive-like anhedonia and characterizations of the neurobiological features of those individuals who engage in escalated aggression after alcohol consumption. So he's going to cl clear up that relationship for us. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for Nice introduction. My job in the next few minutes is to tell you about 50 years worth of research in animals and make sure that um, you understand the um, significance of basic research findings. I decided to um, jump through 10 points and um, see how I'm doing in the time in 15 minutes. Um, so the first point is the obvious one, that two-thirds of all violence really involves alcohol, and that certainly has not been limited to the United States. It started in the Wild West and continues in a Belgian bar, um, Last und Leidenschaft, uh, uh, as illustrated here. The uh, findings are staggering. I just pulled a couple of statistics on associating alcohol and violence. You hear more about it, this is from Ken Leonard. 86% um, homicides, 30% assault offenders, 60% of sexual offenders, 
40% of violent individuals uh, report that alcohol was involved, um, spouse abuse, 75% uh, of alcohol is a major, major contributor to statistics from the 1950s, 60s, all the way to the present, persist with these phenomenally high uh, percentages. So what I would like to do is uh, tell you a little bit about the what happened in alcohol research that is noteworthy uh, for our discussion. Well, the first is the watershed uh, discovery in the 1980s that um, alcohol really doesn't work just on any biological membrane, fluidizes it, but actually works on very specific proteins in the brain. And this uh, really changed the field in alcohol research completely. We shift from just a generalized action to um, action on very specific proteins such as uh, glutamate, uh, such as GABA, such as serotonin. And uh, we can now identify precisely where alcohol acts uh, the third point is that we have to be aware of some very basic pharmacology when we associate alcohol with violence. I uh, won't dwell on this very much other than to emphasize that um, alcohol doesn't work in everybody, but when it works to increase aggression, these are animal data, uh, it has an ascending limb and it has a descending limb. It sedates and it activates, has pro-aggressive and has anti-aggressive actions. And they're very systematic. The low doses uh, in the acute preparation uh, are pro-aggressive. The high doses are anti-aggressive. Um, moreover, if the individual is dependent on alcohol, goes through withdrawal, um, that individual Eventually, as systematic animal studies now show, show with an increasing percentage become violent and aggressive in the withdrawal period. The longer exposed to alcohol, the more intense the withdrawal, the more uh, uh, intensive the uh, aggressive episodes. Moreover, uh, when challenged with uh, glutamate, uh, an excitatory amino acid, um, you can see that alcohol-consuming individual in withdrawal even become hyper-excitable in the phase of, of uh, withdrawal. So biphasic action, uh, withdrawal periods are the phases where we see very large systematic dose-dependent changes in, in aggressive behavior. Fourth point is uh, huge individual differences. The individual differences uh, uh, are striking. Here is a set of data from a large uh, number of animal studies that indicates each bar is a separate individual. And you can see if you average them all together, you would come to the conclusion alcohol has no effect on aggression. Uh, the data show the number of animals against uh, the change in aggressive behavior after a challenge with one modest dose of alcohol. So these are expressed in z-scores. Remember from your statistics, those are the units of standard deviations. So usually we kick out data that are beyond the stippled line because we consider them to be outliers. But you can see that alcohol produces very, very large changes in aggressive behavior in a certain subset of individuals that are colored in here uh, and not in many, many others. So there is a subset of individuals who are very prone to show very large changes in um, aggressive behavior. Who are they and how can we predict them? Can we characterize them? Uh, obviously, the typical clinical epidemiology approach of using a median split is uh, very uh, um, uninformative. If we use the upper and lower thirds of the distribution, we can do a somewhat better job. But here I am using the outlier criterion to identify the individuals that show very large increases in aggressive behavior after a one gram per kilogram um, uh, 
dose of alcohol given even either by a gavage to the animal or um, letting the animal self-administer it. Not only is the nature, is the frequency of the behavior different, it's also the pattern of aggressive behavior changes. In an animal that consumes water, the typical mouse uh, aggression, for those of you who are not mouse aficionados, um, so the typical pattern is um, uh, uh, biting in the rump, but when they're drinking alcohol, the shift in the target changes dramatically. So it's not just the freak, they're doing it more often, they're doing it also in a more injurious manner. So alcohol, uh, let me now switch a little bit to the mechanisms by which this is accomplished. I focus on four or five um, that I highlight. The first one is uh, dopamine. Dopamine, you may remember, is often associated with reward. Um, and in fact, John Paul Scott, the grand old man of animal aggression research many, many years ago said aggression uh, is not only produces dangers, but it pleasures that can be enjoyed. Aggression as a source of satisfaction and pleasure uh, identified already early, early on. And if we look into the animal world, we can actually measure neurochemical events at the time when the individual is about to engage in an aggressive act, when it executes an aggressive act, and when it uh, recovers from it. So here is an opportunity where we can in, uh, study repeated aggressive episodes, always precisely timed at a specific point in the day, uh, one day, all the way to the 10th day. On, on the 11th day, we do nothing, absolutely nothing. What happens in the brain of these animals? They anticipate the aggressive episode by rising their dopamine in the accumbens nucleus, and they drop the serotonin in the uh, cortex uh, before an event that never occurs. So they are conditioned, they're entrained to become very aggressive uh, at a specific time, and the neurochemistry is uh, telling us that there are changes in anticipation of the aggressive event. Um, a dramatic identification of um, uh, neuro specific neurons in the hypothalamus, uh, one of the key areas, was uh, demonstrated in the Anderson lab uh, a year or two ago. Um, uh, first author is Dayun Lin, uh, when they reported uh, by altering the um, cells in the hypothalamus by injecting a virus that contained a channel of rhodopsin that's light sensitive so that the protein could be stimulated with a light pulse. They put a laser into the brain I'll show you a little example. This is not our work. This is the work from the Anderson lab. There's a cannula. There comes the laser, a light pulse. The light pulse now hits the rhodopsin molecule that has been placed there by, a, by an adenovirus. And just a little pulse is sufficient to alter the uh, uh, cellular activity as by, that can be identified with an immediate early gene. Uh, and you can see the staining of these genes very clearly. When the light pulse comes on, the animal, when confronting another animal, switches to the red. The blue light is turned on. There's a sp very specific wavelength uh, comes on, and immediately there is an attack. Another light pulse, another attack. Another light pulse, another attack. So it's a very stimulus locked activity. You can identify a very specific neurons that evokes this. Six days later, the same story. Uh, so it persists. Uh, moreover, the light onset, light offset is uh, associated with late changes in latency and frequency. Uh, and I 
anatomically can identify which neurons are located where in the ventromedial hypothalamus and the dorsal medial, dorsal lateral uh, uh, region. You can precisely identify these techniques haven't been used at all in alcohol research yet um, because nobody does alcohol research in animals. The NIAAA, the NIMH, uh, have, have no program announcement whatsoever in alcohol research on aggression. Uh, so I'm a, a lone survivor here. Um, so you can see that animals, when uh, given a pulse of light in the hypothalamus, attack immediately a moving target and even an inanimate object. Let me illustrate that to you, how powerful of an effect this is. Uh, here is our Mr. Mouse. Um, there's a glove. The light comes on and he attacks the glove. There's a dramatic uh, turn on. The light is off and he stops. Um, it's just an inanimate object. So it's a completely indiscriminate act of biting and attack. Light on, immediately an attack. Light off. There's a light. Off and he stops. So it's a very clear uh, uh, pattern of um, uh, linking specific neurons in the hypothalamus to the initiation of an aggressive episode. A second technique uh, I've just illustrated to you the optogenetic approach, uh, as shown in the Anderson uh, laboratory findings, where you insert a specific light-sensitive protein into the cell membrane that then can be stimulated by a light pulse. But you can also, of course, insert a molecule that's specific only to one chemical, so-called dreads. Uh, you can design the chemical very specifically, or alternatively, you can suppress the uh, release of a transmitter by uh, a toxin. This approach is used by the Dometsky lab uh, over genetics in Har at Harvard. We've just collaborated on a study where we focused on serotonin, which is probably the one neurotransmitter that everybody has associated for the last 40, 50 years with aggression and violence. Uh, and the question is, why are there so many inconsistent findings? Well, it turns out the serotonin story is much more intricate than ever imagined. One of the features that, we, that one now can unravel is that the serotonin neurons in the brainstem are made up of uh, neurons um, that project to areas in the forebrain and the cortex and into the hippocampus and into the striatum that, can, that are very segregated. So the serotonin neurons can be individually turned off silenced uh, by uh, inserting toxins at specific places in the gene. And you can do this in multiple places. One key finding of, the, of this work that is just in the process of being published is that only serotonin neurons that originate in sub-regions of the Rafe, where all serotonin stems from, that also express dopamine receptors are the ones that are important in the initiation of aggressive behavior, not other serotonin neurons. So the serotonin system is really made up of several parallel acting systems. Uh, again, something to be investigated in the future in the context of alcohol. Let me uh, switch to GABA because it was one of the early, early candidate mechanisms for uh, studying uh, alcohol action. And one can manipulate, of course, serotonin is not in the, the rest of the brain is not there to keep serotonin warm. Uh, there are many other neurochemical systems, GABA prominently. And I focus here on the GABA-A receptor uh, uh, because it has been the target of action for alcohol. Alcohol acts there as a, a positive allosteric modulator and facilitates the action. Many, many years ago, it became clear that alcohol, like many other positive allosteric modulators, the libriums and valiums of this world, um, has an ascending limb. In other words, low doses increase aggression in rats, in mice, 
very clear uh, uh, pro-aggressive effect. And then, of course, it also has sedative effects at higher doses. I illustrated that already earlier. And it's very, very similar to other allosteric modulators in this regard. Whenever a substance has such contrary effects, pro and anti-aggressive effect, immediately the idea arises, uh, must be different mechanism. And the key finding in the early, uh, around 2000, was the discovery in the 1990s actually already, was a discovery that there are different genes that encode subunits of the GABA-A receptor. And you can uh, show them with a immunohistochemical technique uh, that the alpha-1, alpha-2, alpha-3 subunits all have a different distribution, some in the hippocampus, some in the cortex, others in the hypothalamus, others in the striatum. So the question is, are these different subunits encoding different functions? Uh, is there relevance to this uh, machinery that has been uncovered? Uh, and the answer is very much so. Uh, alpha-2 subunits are required for pro-aggressive effects to occur, at least at, in animal preparations. So we know that certain individuals are prone or less prone to show pro-aggressive effects if they have intact alpha-2 subunits. If you stimulate uh, GABA generally, either GABA-A or GABA-B receptors with baclofen or musimol, you can double in the, in the um, uh, rafe, dorsal rafe nuclei, you can double the amount of aggression that is produced with this uh, neurochemical stimulation. Uh, lastly, lastly, <laughs> very good. <laughs> lastly, I will. Um, I'm only 30 seconds over time, uh, so <laughs> so um, you probably were expecting a calm talk, very. <laughs> but it's only t only 15 minutes, right? So uh, lastly, I will speak about um, at least one or two observations with neuropeptides. Neuropeptides, uh, when I went to school, were not in the brain. There were stuff in the gut. Uh, you didn't learn about neuropeptides. In the meantime, we learned that they are critically important in particularly modulating alcohol-heightened aggression. One key peptide to highlight, oh, first the glutamate story and then the peptide. Here, the glutamate receptor, again, this is one of several glutamate receptors, the NMDA receptor. And if you listen to Tom Enzel and psychosis, this is where the action is. Um, this is where you can alter a psychotic outburst dramatically. There are many subunits, and one of them can be targeted with an Alzheimer drug, Memantin. And Memantin, well known, is used clinically, uh, produces absolutely no effect whatsoever in those individuals that show heightened aggression, but enhances aggressive in behavior, in aggressive behavior in individuals who do not show heightened aggression. Uh, so we know that there is a significant role of NMDA receptors in um, uh, alcohol heightened aggression, not just GABA. So the story becomes now quite intricate. We have and uh, a go mechanism like uh, glutamate and a stop mechanism like GABA turning on, turning off serotonin cells that are in the RAFE and some serotonin cells, subsystems, uh, are responsible for the heightened aggression. Finally, some uh, CRF data you heard uh, from Jim Blair about, uh, at least I hope he said that, uh, Jim Blair, something about stress uh, mod uh, modulation. Uh, and its role in, in alcohol. And here is the evidence that the data showing that individuals that show high levels of aggressive behavior, this is a mouse preparation, selectively decrease it when micro-injected with uh, a CRFR1 antagonist, one of the receptors for corticotrophic releasing factor. Uh, and this is another compound, uh, very similar effect. And what's interesting, it's only the alcohol heightened aggressive component, not other aggressive acts that are species typical were affected. So it's this escalated form of aggression. So what I've, I've done is I hope I've persuaded you that there is value in um, 
teasing apart very systematically dose-dependent, time-dependent, exposure-dependent uh, type of aggressive behavior in animal preparations uh, that one can actually model at the level of the mouse, at the level of the rat, uh, by in using invasive measurement techniques that would be otherwise completely unacceptable in human research. Um, you can actually find out what happens in the brain of these individuals that show alcohol heightened aggression. So we can show that animals are readily provoked, show high rates of very intense and tissue damaging aggression, show um, a, a type of aggressive behavior that is uh, powerfully extended, uh, is ob oblivious to appeasement signals, insensitive to long-term consequences, and I have to conclude, of course, with a photo from last night's party. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to save questions till the very end.